Hello and welcome to another ASCII lunchtime webinar. My name is Clint Burtonshaw, Head of Operations and Education at ASCII, and I welcome you once again to yet another fantastic presentation. Uh, just as a matter of housekeeping, throughout this session, it will be recorded and it will be uh, placed up available to all attendees post uh, once we've edited it up, of course. Um, if you do have any questions throughout the session, do feel free to uh, ask those questions in the Q&A box. And throughout the session, you will be uh, given the opportunity to participate in a couple of polls. So uh, make sure that you do have access to your computer to be able to participate in those. We'll generally allow about 30 seconds or so to answer. They are multiple choice, so it shouldn't take too long at all all. Okay, well, I would like to introduce you to Hayley Jarrick. Hayley is the CEO of Supply Chain Sustainability School, and today she will be presenting on uh, modern slavery, in particularly, where do you use slavery in your supply chain? Hayley is experienced in governance and strategic management in manufacturing, residential and commercial building, heavy construction, professional services, and international trade. Hayley has previously worked for the Resolution Institute, Infrastructure Sustainability Council of Australia, and Blue Scope Steel. Hayley, over to yourself. Thanks, Clint. I hope everyone can hear me fine and that we're all um, excited to be able to do this webinar um, today because I'm very excited to be able to do it with you. Um, before we get started, there's a couple of things that I'd like to do. The first one is just um, an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are all meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And the second thing I'd like to do before we get um, too much into this is just to point out to everybody that your well-being is very important um, to me and to everybody else that you work with um, and your family at home. So because some of the subject matter that we're going to go through today might cause some distress, um, please take the time to debrief afterwards with, if you're in a boardroom with um, colleagues, take the time to debrief with colleagues if, it, if anything that we talk about touches you. Um, or if you have a mental health first aid officer and you'd like to go and speak to them, please do so or contact your workplace assistance program or a medical practitioner. Um, and if you're in um, an immediate need of care and don't have those um, opportunities those avenues available to you, then please contact Lifeline. So I'll begin um, the, the content of this, of this presentation and it's sort of, I suppose it's fairly an, an emotive heading to be able to get you all into, to listen to this webinar is where is um, modern, where do you use modern slavery? Um, which of course then opens the questions of, hang on, I don't know whether I do use it. Um, and so to begin the present, to begin this webinar to work through, I think it's a really important first step is to actually touch on exactly what is modern slavery and what we're talking about here. The modern slavery is often associated with human rights infringements imposed centuries ago, um, often by wealthy or privileged landowners across the globe. And by this reasoning, the term would be considered redundant in today's more enlightened society, unfortunately, the reality is quite different. And modern slavery is a broad term applied to different kinds of forced labour that continue to exist in supply chains around the world. The term modern slavery is used to describe situations where coercion, threats or deception are used to exploit victims and undermine or deprive them of their freedom. So in a modern context, shackles aren't always physical, um, but can be fear of punishment in some form. And those punishments may include threats of violence, but often includes more subtle or discreet coercive practices like deception or abuse of vulnerability or abuse of power. Um, some of those forms of punishment may include uh, underrepresenting and misrepresenting the work that's being offered, uh, non or delayed payment of wages, confiscation of documents like passports, um, psychological abuse and intimidation, threats to family or threats of deportation. And so modern slavery has no single legal definition around the world, but is used as an umbrella term to describe different cases of human exploitation where victims can't refuse to leave. So many people around the world feel that they are in bad jobs or that they're not paid enough. Uh, and that's not that is not modern slavery. But the difference between modern slavery is that uh, is those that are caught up in modern slavery can't just walk out and they can't just look for another job. And they may not have chosen the situation that they're in or they may be afraid to leave because of what might happen to them or their family. Um, and often because their pay rights or documents have been withheld. 
So of the different, um, so the Australian Act calls on eight different types um, of modern slavery that are included in the Australian context, and I'll run through each of them um, individually with you. So they're on, uh, like I said, all underneath that umbrella term. So slavery is seen um, to occur when an enslaved person is owned, either from birth or by other some other form of control of that person. So they're often treated like commodities and bought and sold and they don't have any free will. And some people can be born into this slave-like class with a community because their parents were previously enslaved um, and they remain slavery by descent. Child labor or child slavery um, is a, as another category as well. So child labour can be work that deprives children of their childhood by endangering their physical or psychological development and restricting their access to education. The worst forms of child labour involve work that is considered hazardous, affecting a child's health, safety and development. So not all work done by children are cl is classified as child labour. Um, and that's, the, the, that's um, some of the elements, that the, the worst elements is what we're targeting for elimination. And where you might see um, where children might work in agricultural communities or work on their parents' farms or in their parents' workplaces, that's not necessarily modern slavery or, or child labour in that sense. Human trafficking uh, refers to those actions involved in the forced movement of people using violence, threats or deception for the purposes of exploitation. If the victim is a child, it is enough that the child is trafficked and exploited for someone else's gain and people may be moved within a region, within a country or across borders. Debt bondage occurs when people borrow money or incur a charge, for example, for arranging work or documents or service, and are then for forced to work to pay off that debt. Highly inflated interest rates are often applied to the debt, so it becomes extremely difficult to be paid off. Forced labour uh, refers to any forced work or service that a person has not been given voluntarily, but because they have been threatened with some form of punishments. And punishments can take the form of what we described about earlier, like threats of violence to themselves or their family, withholding documents or wages, or threats of loss of employment or forms of abuse. Servitude is similar to forced labour, except servitude contains the added requirement that the person also is also deprived of their personal freedom outside of work. People are often required to live in the workplace or under the constant supervision um, and are subject to violence and threats and are unable to leave. Servitude is commonly associated with domestic labor and in the sex industry. Forced marriage is where a person is forced to marry without giving their consent because of threats, deception, physical or emotional financial pressure or abuse. And deceptive recruiting is where the victim is deceived about whether, they'd, uh, whether they'll be exploited uh, furtherly exploited through some type of modern slavery. So promised one thing and um, find out um, all too late that it is something else. So in 2018, the Global Slavery Index estimated that there are over 40 million victims of modern slavery practices worldwide today. And due to the nature of that data, this figure may be on the low side. And so of those 40 million people, 71% uh, are female. 24.9 uh, million are in forced labour, 15.4 million are in forced marriage, and 10 million of those are children. And so looking more closely in the, the Asia and Pacific context in which we're in today, um, many Australian supply chains would lead directly into this Asia Pacific region where 56% of the world's population and 62% of the global estimate of slaves are occupied. So that's over 25 million people in slavery just in this area. 66% um, of these are in forced labour and 34% of these are in forced marriage. So the hidden nature of modern slavery allows it to exist and flourish in complex global supply chains. Modern slavery com commonly occurs in regions and industries that supply materials and products and rely on workers to carry out jobs that are hazardous, low skilled, often seasonal and low paying. Industries are at risk of modern slavery occurring in their supply chains, where there are a large labour force is needed and where there is a high resource demand. Industries where labour requirements are outsourced or require high quantities of materials, products or parts are often multi-tiered supply chains. These may contribute to a lack of visibility and control over the recruitment and employment practices of suppliers and subcontractors. Modern slavery risks increase where suppliers operate in one or more of these high risk regions. These regions often suffer from limited regulation, high levels of corruption and low levels of education. 
And the data that you're seeing on the screen at the moment is um, an excerpt from that Global Slavery Index document where the, uh, the 40.3 million people um, were estimated. Um, and this is a summary of the products that are at risk of forced labour by country. So I'd probably encourage everybody um, on the webinar right now is just to have a look through that list as you're probably doing as I was talking and having a look to see whether you use any of those products in your supply chain and where you're sourcing them from and are those product uh, region correlations, do they exist in your supply chains? In Australia, that same um, research estimated that 15,000 people are living in modern slavery. Now you may have heard some different um, statistics as to what that number might be in Australia and there are a few different um, research studies that people revert back to and some of those um, historically might have come from different sources like the Australian Institute of Criminology who found 1900 victims when they did a survey from uh, uh, July 2015 to June 2017 and in that same piece of research they estimated that for every victim they actually detected uh, that four remained undetected. Uh, previous global slavery indexes had Australia at low as 4,300 um, and of course as the Modern Slavery Act is put into play and more organisations are consciously looking for these conditions and trying to eradicate them it's likely that these numbers will go up before they'll start going down purely because uh, these atrocities are now becoming visible where they were previously hidden. I touched br uh, briefly before about the Act and what that means. So the next session of this presentation will go through sort of what that compliance is. And so if we look um, at the Commonwealth Modern Slavery Act, which was um, put into place in 2018, um, essentially there are three elements to that Act. That act actually points out who the act applies to, which is about 3,000 entities um, and the Australian government and anybody who has over 100 million of consolidated annual revenue, whether you're an Australian entity or a foreign entity carrying on business in Australia. It also sets out the Australian government obligations, uh, which include setting up a modern, uh, a modern slavery business engagement unit to support industry to review the act after three years, report annually to parliament on the implementation of the act and publish reports on the central online website. And then, of course, there's a, the element that most people talk about within this Act, and that's the requirement of annual modern, modern slavery statements. Uh, these statements must be um, approved by the board and signed by a director or the equivalent of in your organisation. There's seven criteria that you must include within that, within that statement, that they are due within six months of the end of annual reporting period, that they're published by you in a public place and by the Australian government, and heads up, you will be compared to others. Um, and they also driving and seeking continual improvement of the investigation and eradication of modern slavery over time. So within that reporting criteria, like I said, we were talking about the different structures within that. Um, and so there are different elements that you must include in that statement. The obvious one is the name of your company as an entity. Um, the second one is the structure and operations. So this may include which subsidiary organisations or different factions or divisions that are included within your statement. And I suppose the, the word of um, advice in this place is you may be able to, depending on how you want to include or exclude, people will look at this part of your statement to see what, why you're excluding certain parts of your organisation and what they may be able to imply from that. Um, so given that this, the overall structure of this whole system is to incentivise people to become more open and transparent around their supply chains, um, I'd be uh, paying close attention to that part of your statement when you're putting it together to ensure that uh, people aren't going to imply certain things that may not be there um, by including or excluding certain parts of your operations. Uh, the next part of the report, we'll need to identify your key modern slavery risks, and you'll also need to identify the actions being taken to address them. You'll also be required to assess how uh, effective you are in those actions are being taken in order to reduce um, modern slavery in your supply chain, and what consultation has taken place within different parts of your business. You'll also be given the opportunity um, for any other initiatives such as consultation and collaboration with other not-for-profits and NGOs and other organisations within your industry. So the one thing to point out here is that the principal objective is not that every organisation has perfect supply chains, but the supply chains become increasingly visible and transparent. So stakeholders will make their own choice uh, between organisations once given this information. 
And so you, need, I suppose, every organisation and stakeholder out there will need to then um, decide for themselves. Um, will you go with organisation A that makes a publicly available statement about modern slavery risks and their, and their supply chains and what they're doing about it? Or do you support company B that's doing nothing about modern slavery? And that's why um, the Act requires entity to disclose publicly how they're addressing those improvements. The New South Wales Modern Slavery Bill passed in June 2018 and is intended to cover public and private sector organisations with a turnover of more than 50 million operating with staff in New South Wales. The Act has not commenced, but it um, and so its directions are not yet in force. But on the 6th of August 2019, the Legislative Council Standing Committee on Social Issues announced an inquiry into the, the Act, um, the Modern Slavery Amendment Bill and the Modern Slavery Regulations, and the New South Wales Government response to modern slavery will be shaped by the committee's recommendations and they're expected any day now in this month. The key differences or, uh, between the, the Commonwealth Act and the New South Wales Act is the New South Wales Act is intended to be complementary to the Federal Act. Um, the New South Wales um, system has put in place an interim anti-slavery commissioner for New South Wales, so Professor, Professor Jennifer Byrne. And the New South Wales Act also includes penalties of up to 1.1 million for failing to report or making false statements, which is different from the Commonwealth Act. So uh, we did touch base that we're going to have some polls. So here's the opportunity for you to um, pipe up with your first poll that should pop up on your screen. Um, and that is just to let us know is, are you ready for your first year of reporting? So we've got a couple of options in there. So one of them is, yep, we're all set. Um, <laughs> the second one is almost there. We're probably in the process of getting ready for it. Um, no, not yet, or no, haven't even, nowhere near it, haven't even started. So I haven't been in there. So we'll give you about 30 seconds to respond to that. And while you're doing that, I'll just let you know that um, both the Federal and New South Wales Acts make provision for voluntary reporting by other entities based on um, entities that are based and operating in Australia. So organisations are all encouraged to report voluntarily, even if you don't meet those uh, 50 million and $100 million uh, thresholds to get in place. And so forward thinking organisations want to be seen as good corporate citizens, win tenders, contracts from government agencies and large contractors, they'll need to be more transparent about the risks in their supply chain. And increasing transparency will form part of attracting good staff, raising finance and achieving industry ratings. Quint, do we have a response yet to the first poll? Um, got, got them coming through it the moment Haley. <laughs> no worries probably going to give everyone about another 30 seconds I think I can see okay. people are taking their time to have a bit of a think <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everyone's warming up and went oh that was caught off guard and I wasn't ready to click a button on that one so I'll we'll give you a few extra seconds All right, we've got about five responses out of 16 attendees. Okay, six out of 60, come on. Here we go. <laughs> Lucky I don't have names. I could start picking on people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a few people around boardrooms that are trying to figure out. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's how they can do this. On a group Very good call. point. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to close off the poll now. Um, if anyone wants to make any comments, feel free to be it in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, but yes, you will now see the results in a moment. And there you go. There you go. Well, that's a pretty good spread. So um, I suppose there's one one that nowhere near starting, and I suppose that may even be is it are you required to put one in or is it a voluntary type thing? Um, and two that haven't done anything yet, I suppose they're probably in the same bucket. But it's good to see that you know there's a couple of people that are all set ready to go, and a couple that are sort of getting started and and kicking into that process, which is really positive to see. Um, mm. We'll have a there's a couple of other polls coming up, so please don't feel like you're you're missing out. Um, but it'd be great to get your interaction through that as well. And so it's, it's interesting then to take that, that risk of everyone coming through and actually then looking to say, well, what are the risks associated um, with having modern slavery in your supply chain? Um, and then what risks are associated with presenting those modern slavery statements? 
And then what are the risks associated if you don't present the statements and things happen, or if you're, if you're thinking about voluntarily um, progressing things as well. And so there's a few different risk factors that you should consider um, for your organisation as you move around the place. So one is around reputational risk. And so because the issue of modern slavery is becoming the subject of greater scrutiny from investors, government um, and the public, especially for high risk industries. So not taking action to investigate, act or report on modern slavery cases in the, the supply chain can gravely damage your business's reputation. And once your reputation is called into question, it can lead to drop in sales, decrease of your company's market value, reduction of your market share and challenge your access to capital. Investors may not want to be associated with a risky investment. Operational risks are different again. So the social license to operate is the ongoing acceptance of a community and stakeholders to carry out business operations in a particular context. If your company loses its social license to operate, investors vote against directors who don't tackle the issue. Communities may block your project's development. Your employees may wish to work for another company. Your competitors may see the opportunity to strengthen their own license. All local governments, media and non-government organisations may put enough pressure on you that you're forced to shut down. There are financial risks. So public awareness about modern slavery is growing. News outlets and watchdog organisations are uncovering cases of modern slavery at a faster pace than they make and they make sure that they linked companies are held accountable. If your company is caught in a case of modern slavery, this may lead to unexpected significant expenses, so high costs of finance, investors withdrawing capital, remediation costs, legal fees um, to protect from liability, penalties and fines imposed by governments, and damage claims by customers and other stakeholders. There's also the market risk. So modern slavery in your supply chain can put you at risk of not being able to acquire new customers or retain existing ones. Your customers are also pressured by investors to make assessment of your risk as their supplier. Following regulation, public uh, procurement tenders will require suppliers to report on the prevalence of modern slavery in your supply chain and what you're doing to address it. Other customers may decide to request changes in their own supply chain practices and drop you as a supplier. So of those people, uh, especially everyone around um, the room that said that they're either on top of this or they're sort of starting that process and some may not even be um, in the process of trying to put a statement together. But in terms of the next poll that we're going to put up there, so Clint, get, if you get ready. Um, the next question we're looking to try and ask everybody is, well, which function within your organisation um, is driving the project of this to be able to come through? That's not the right poll. We might have to skip over that one, Haley, as I don't have that. <laughs> That's fine. Available. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So I suppose that the, the reason why that we want to put this poll out there is because um, what I've seen across many different organisations as well is the department that's driving um, the response to modern, the modern slavery risk is very different as we go from um, organisation to organisation. So sometimes that's taken from a supply chain group perspective. Sometimes procurement leads are taking that on board. Um, sometimes the risk and compliance team are taking that on board. Um, other times sustainability departments are taking that on board. Um, sometimes their chief financial officer or human uh, resource department or corporate um, social responsibility groups or investor community groups are taking that on board. And where I've seen um, the most traction in that space is where all of those different functional departments actually work together to try and um, produce a coordinated response. So whether it's not just one department taking on the full burden of ensuring that the compliance to this is taking place, but there's usually a committee of people who are constantly into play. And I think this is one area where there isn't a clear distinction from department to department as to who can take on that risk and everybody is doing it differently. Haley, I might just jump in there for a second. Um, guys, you actually had the opportunity to answer that. That was a, um, showed up in the first poll as question two. So, yeah, um, we actually had quite a um, number of responses. Let me just pull, share those results again and you'll see which function is driving the project. Yes, yeah, so I'm not surprised that it's coming from a procurement perspective or a risk and compliance. Um, yeah, and I'm assuming those that are other, like sometimes it's yeah, sustainability departments or their communications investor departments or other sort of areas that are coming through as well. So that's fairly typical of, of, of what we're seeing where someone's leading this through. Um, and then, like I said, hopefully a couple of the, you know, 
in the other department there, if you have a committee of people who have joint responsibility around this, then good on you, because that's where I think that the, um, the most successful um, projects are coming from in this space. And I suppose, is this the, was this the question that you were about to put up, Clint? Yeah, here we go. So this is the next one is to sort of say, well, are you utilising this reporting opportunity as an opportunity within your business? And while you're um, all clicking through and madly responding to that one, um, and then please answer the next one while you're there, um, and we can bring that up again later. Um, it's just to sort of talk through about, like, what, what opportunities this then creates. So like I said, this the risk of modern slavery crosses over many different departments and it impacts many people throughout the entire process. So whether you work in your sales team and your customers are asking you for information, whether you work in procurement and you're actually um, interrogating your suppliers as to the risk and how that risk is applying back to you, um, whether you work in HR and you're looking to try and assess the risk of the workforce that you're actually currently operating in, how much of that is directly employed? Um, are there any subcontractors in that you um, employ into your business to be able to do that work for you? How certain are you that they don't subcontract that, inf that labor out or that the people that they're employing under those um, contractor arrangements aren't in conditions um, of modern slavery? Um, and so I think that this is, this is creating um, a, a broader context conversation within businesses and getting cross um, departmental teams working together for a common cause. And we'll give you probably about another 10 seconds, 15 seconds, Clint. Yeah, 15 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> um, as you go through to sort of say, yeah, this is actually helping us to develop those relationships better. And of course, that's also, this is just a great opportunity to work with, um, you know, if you work with your supply chain, um, we're finding that this is, um, I've done a lot of supplier workshops with people where they are um, looking to pull in all of their key suppliers to talk through this issue and work through some solutions as to how you can work with your supply chain in order to eradicate these. And organisations that are doing great work in this space are really happy to be able to share and develop those partnerships and build that really that stronger relationship to try and eradicate some of these bigger issues rather than um, just creating a relationship based on, you know, uh, exchanging money for service for goods and services amongst that space. So we've got the poll results up. And it's great to see that yeah, we've got a couple of people that are, look, that are looking to collaborate better and creating visibility with suppliers and building risk profiles for suppliers, which is great. Um, and then a couple that are using them to report on sustainability targets, which is great, and someone that's not using them at all. So I suppose the, the person who responded to, no, we're not using this um, as an opportunity at all. At all. Um, I suppose my only word of caution there is to look at everybody else who is. Um, and just ensure that you're not left behind, um, that this isn't just a, a really a burning platform that you are taking full advantage of to try and build those additional relationships within your business whilst trying to eradicate this horrific human right abuse from our supply chains. And so I suppose now that we've really sort of unpacked exactly what um, modern slavery is and the compliance requirements around that, um, we can then double back to sort of the original question that we asked, which is, well, where do you use slavery in your supply chain? And I, I suppose in framing this question is very deliberately a where do you use up slavery in your supply chain and not do you use slavery in your supply chain? Because if you look at those global statistics and you look at the inherent nature of how this is hidden, it is entirely likely that there is something within your supply chain that you're unaware of. And so it's a matter of, you know, when you find it, not if you find it. And what I increasingly hear from a number of um, support organisations and non-government organisations who are eagerly awaiting all of the modern slavery statements to come out so that they can interrogate them. Uh, if you are planning on putting in your um, modern slavery statement, uh, no, we've had a look, all good, we don't use slavery in our supply chain, therefore we don't need to do any actions um, and we think that's pretty effective, uh, then you will be on the top of their list to interrogate your entire supply chain on your behalf to try and find out what you've missed. Um, and yet those organisations that 
are openly looking and finding and uh, where incidents are being investigated and reported, they're the ones that are going um, to come out of this probably with the most credibility um, because there is nobody in this space that's looking at those numbers that we just um, went through and presented before and then actually sat back and went, well, you know, it's prob there's a high probability that it's going to be somewhere in something that we do. So if we haven't found it, we're not looking hard enough. And so to help you guide you through what that um, then looks like is then let's have a really interrogation of all of those statistics and that study um, from those, that 40.3 million and have a look at the high risk regions. Um, so looking in at these, this is just data that's pulled straight out of that global, the global slavery index. Um, and so when you're looking at one slavery in your supply chain, you consider um, the following statistics about these different countries. And so where are you sourcing your goods from? So uh, of that, that mix, so we've got some mix in there of um, obviously Asia and the Pacific is fairly high risk regions, um, followed by Africa, um, and then Europe and Central Asia is, is sort of third on that top list. And if I sort of drill down to that into country specific, um, you know, India is estimated to have uh, nearly 8 billion, um, oh, sorry, 8 million um, slaves within its country. China's got 3.8, Pakistan 3.2, Korea 2.6 million, uh, Nigeria 1.38 million, Iran 1.29 million, Indonesia 1.2 million, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is 1 million, uh, Russia has almost 800,000 and Philippines uh, 784,000 estimated victims of modern slavery within their countries at the moment. So if you're looking at those regions and you're thinking that you either uh, you pulled your supply chain from any of those regions or especially that sort of that top list of countries that I just ran through, um, then I'd probably be flagging um, those suppliers as higher risk um, in your supply chains. And if you overlay that country type diag um, diagnostic um, with high risk sectors within that supply chain. So the International Labour Organization has identified all of uh, these sectors as being high risk sectors of modern slavery and supply chains. So domestic work um, is the highest along with construction, manufacturing, um, agriculture, forestry and fishing, accommodation and food services, wholesale and trade, personal services and mining and quarrying. So once again, if you're looking to interrogate your own supply chain and you're going through saying, do you purchase from any of these sectors, um, then, and especially if you're then ticking this box as well as the regional country box, then the risk of those, the modern slavery within that supplier um, is increased as well. The third source that I strongly encourage everybody to look through um, is the Voices, Narratives by Survivors of Modern Slavery database. And this database is run by the University of Nottingham. And it contain, it's the world's largest archive of modern slavery survivor narratives. So across more than 1 million words spoken or written by survivors of modern slavery. And they can say, you can see why slavery persists in particular hotspots, analyze patterns in trafficking routes, identifying vulnerabilities, understand more about the challenges that survivors face in liberation and discover new anti-slavery solutions. All these narratives offer a chance to systematically design new anti-slavery strategies based on the experiences, ideas, and solutions of enslaved people themselves. So uh, I'll, there's a link to this on the web, on our website that I can, I'll make sure it gets accessible to everybody as well. But like I said, there's more than a thousand stories that are available in this database. If you're not jumping in and reading them and then asking yourself, if that was me and if that was happened in my supply chain, would the procedures, processes, policies that I have in place prevent this from occurring, or how would I even know this was happening within my supply chain, uh, then those uh, understanding those true stories from people is the first place, uh, the more human aspect you can go to, to try and find out uh, where you think your high risk um, areas might be as well. And the example that I've put up on the screen there is one that um, it seems to be common for a lot of people. And this is one from Europe. So this is um, not um, anywhere remote where you think sort of, you know, London, <laughs> you know, I'm coming to London. I didn't, you wouldn't necessarily flag that as a high risk country of area, but it could happen anywhere. Um, of just someone who was looking to try and find work as a chef um, 
came up to a guy who was looking to recruit and said that if he paid up front, he can get his visa sorted. Um, so you borrow some money to pay this recruiter. Um, and then when you arrive, the plan completely changed. And now all of a sudden you're getting on a bus to somewhere that's not in London, but in somewhere a remote village in Scotland. Um, and that you happen to be working in this um, really unrealistic, unrealistic conditions where you're the only person servicing a high demand. And yet all of these public figures and tourist coaches and tourists come through this place every day, but no one ever recognizes that you're in that con con um, condition that you're in. Um, and then whilst you're intended to be able to send money home to your family, but you just never got paid. So now you're stuck in this, um, in this condition where you owe a large sum of money, but you're not actually receiving any income and where you actually tried to get this arrangement so that you could send money back to your home. Now they're left completely in the dark without you being there. Um, and this, this, uh, the structure of this story is repeated a number of times um, through the Voices database. Um, and I'm sure that if you sort of looked in there and thought about every hotel you've ever stayed at, um, every restaurant you ever went to, every cafe, you know, how certain are you that the people working behind the scenes are not in conditions of slavery? Um, and then how would you possibly find that out? So I suppose in terms of then looking for risk factors um, in assessing where that, the, where that risk might come in, the first sort of area of the risk factor to look into assess is on recruitment and hiring. So things that you might want to look out for, are if there's a long change of labour recruiters that may make it more difficult to see the conditions under which people have been employed and to verify human rights through the supply chain. Um, whether there's high recruitment feeds that may lead to excessive debts being imposed by potential incidents of debt bondage. Um, and where there's no contracts of employment in place, or it may be difficult to know what has been promised to the worker and what practices are actually going on. You also might want to look into the conditions of employment of people in your supply chain. You know, are there excessive work hours? Are there irregular contract provisions, such as no holiday leave entitlements or no indication of normal working hours? Um, is there limited communication? Um, do they confiscate mobile phones or refuse outside interaction? Is there a restriction of freedom of movement? Of movement sorry? Are there high levels of security in the workplace? Um, is there organised transport to and from the workplace um, and to their point of accommodation? Are there irregular salary deductions or excessive deductions for food and accommodation? Which is one of the uh, sort of a high risk factor in those debt bondage situations where um, you may be required to live in the accommodation they provide and they'll provide you a store that you must buy your food from. But the prices of that accommodation and the cost of um, purchasing things from that store are so exorbitant um, that you'll find that at the end of the week that even if they do pay you, the amount of money you owe in that sort of living condition leaves you little and sometimes increases your debt um, rather than tries to reduce that debt as it moves through. But there is hope at the end of this, and there are some actions, and here's some ideas for some actions um, that you sh that everybody can do in this place to try and um, reduce the risk of slavery within their supply chains, and then investigate and eradicate it from their supply chains. So the first um, the first group of things is around review things. So review your policies and procedures and codes of conduct to reflect modern slavery legislation. Review your grievance mechanisms and encourage the free flow of information. And when reviewing those grievance mechanisms, check in place to see how can people access those grievance mechanisms and do they functionally have the capability to do that? So if your sole grievance mechanism is a uh, employee hotline service or a phone number, would victims of slavery who don't have access to their own phones or a phone system be able to, accommodate, to access that grievance mechanism within your supply chain? Also look to review procurement contracts and ensure that modern slavery risks are minimised within those contracts. And then secondly, rather, and not just reviewing um, your in-house operations and finding out what you need to do, the second step is around developing things. So developing networks for increasing cross-sector knowledge and transfer. So things like that are attend conferences, attend networking events, attend your ASCII face-to-face um, -face and webinar events, um, come and meet me at the conference this year and talk to me and hook up with people in your like-minded industry um, to try and set up that network around you so that you've got your finger on the pulse of what's going on around you. Develop training for your staff, clients and suppliers to understand modern slavery risks and actions to be taken. I liken um, education in this space like uh, developing an, an 
uh, getting immunized to um, a virus. So not everybody can have access to that, um, to that information and education. So certainly people that are kept in um, forced labor situations or um, without people that don't have access to um, anyone outside of their direct employer aren't going to be able to access that information. But if you can get everybody within the building that that person has to operate in, understanding the key risk factors um, and what to look out for in this space, then similarly to the way that vaccinations can protect against certain viruses, that education works like an immunisation to those people who can't be um, vaccinated themselves to help them out, find out and, and get them out of those situations where they could be vulnerable. It's also important to develop um, continuous engagement with your suppliers to assess the performance against your non-slavery criteria. If you had planned to do a one-off project to um, audit everybody in your supply chain or investigate everybody once, um, or whether your process is that only on onboarding new suppliers we do these checks, um, then you will miss some of that continuous engagement conversation. You will miss people that um, change their processes over time or have um, developed things along the way um, that may be of risk to your organisation. And so I'm going to run through a bit of a, a quick case study that I hope resonates with everybody and it's around um, Rip Curl. Um, so for those that weren't aware, back in February 2016, the Sydney Morning Herald, um, two journalists in the Sydney Morning Herald put out a, um, an article uh, that basically said, um, paraphrasing of course, that the surf clothing label Rip Curl is using slave labour to manufacture clothes in North Korea. Um, and that has sold millions of dollars worth of clothes made in North Korea where factory workers endure slave-like conditions. The workers in North Korea are routinely exploited and the employees are forced to work long hours with minimal and sometimes no pay. And so the first time Rip Curl hears about all of this is when it's all over the paper. And so then the response to that is one that I think is um, what I find really interesting and one, one of the reasons why I wanted to use this as the case study to go through. So I suppose the first thing that's really important is um, senior executives within Rip Curl immediately respond saying that um, Rip Curl takes its social compliance obligations really seriously, um, that this was a case of a supplier diverting part of their production order to an unauthorised subcontractor with the production done in an unauthorised factory in an unauthorised country without the knowledge or consent in clear breach of supplier terms and policies. So, whereas um, previously we sort of pointed out that, yes, review all your policies and procedures and codes of conduct, update your contracts, and make sure your grievance mechanisms exist. Those are things that are essential to have, but if you're relying on that to try and um, ensure that your supply chain is free, it won't work because you actually must then accompany that uh, with developing those networks and training and constantly um, checking and monitoring all of those supply chain aspects. Um, and one thing that I find um, that I applaud Rip Curl in this place is that the directors of Rip Curl took full responsibility for the screw up. They apologised for it. Um, they acknowledged to all of their customer bases that this causes really moral concern and they have a great responsibility to get rid of um, this and make sure that this never happens again. Um, and more importantly, they then took action to try and make things right. So it wasn't just admitting fault. Um, but then really took those actions to make things right. And since the, that this came out, they have reviewed their environmental policies. They've um, continued a partnership with WWF. They've signed the apparel and footwear supply chain transparency pledge. Um, they developed a factory worker code of conduct. They've undertake regular factory visits to ensure that the product development remains transparent. Um, they've become a signatory to the Australian packaging covenant. Um, and also, um, in 2019 sought their ethical fashion uh, report, um, different statuses within there amongst many other things. And so one thing that's sort of come out of that is that is to ensure that, you know, with all of this, there's no quick fixes to eradicating modern slavery from your business, but it does take a continued effort to achieve the changes in the right way through the supply chain, especially one that involves many sectors in many countries. Um, but the actions you take or don't take could make or break your business. Um, and I think we asked this question before, but maybe Clint, you can flick the results of this poll up as well of, well, so do you have sustainability targets for your supply chain? And by sustainability targets, um, my definition of that that is more broadly is social, environmental and um, economic sustainability targets for your for your entire supply chain. And so if we're looking at those results, um, then yes, it's great to see that many people do um, and only one organisation doesn't. 
um, I, for that, that person that said, no, please give me a call. I'd love to know why you don't or what I can do to help you get them. <laughs> um, but it's great to see that others um, use them to collaborate. Uh, can we scroll down? I think I might be looking at the wrong one. Yeah, one there. Um, so yeah, there's most people do have some level of sustainability targets within their organisations and there's a couple that don't. Um, but for those that don't, like I said, it's sort of one of those think about what you want to do because sometimes um, and what we've found is that even if some of those indicators don't necessarily indicate modern slavery within your supply chain, there's a strong correlation between those that um, don't have or aren't trying to access um, really good social, environmental and economic targets um, that are also businesses that don't value the human rights of, uh, of people that they um, have working for them. And so the next question that um, uh, the next section of this presentation is sort of worked through is then also what do you do? What is your modern slavery action plan? And, and what are you doing in this space? And sort of I'll double back to the one um, slide that we put up previously, which is around the Commonwealth reporting criteria and those seven elements that you're putting through in your statement. Um, and where I work with people in them um, is directly addressed to a few of those. So when people are asked what actions are being taken to address risk, like I work with the, the partners of a supply chain sustainability school where they request their staff and suppliers to complete our free online training around modern slavery. Um, we also work with them to facilitate internal multi-departmental workshops on modern slavery and approach to removing it from the supply chain. So they can take, you know, that's the consultation they do within their business. Um, and they also include in their statements that when their financial partners are the supply chain school, they ensure that these educational resources are available to everyone in Australia who has access to the internet. So it creates that herd immunity approach. Um, and this is primarily where, um, um, as the CEO of the school, um, I partner with all of our organisations to try and do, um, through education, um, eradicate modern slavery from people's supply chains. So for those of you that don't know the school, just, these are quick spiels of we don't just do training on modern slavery, but we do things on a number of environmental, social, and economic um, sustainability to uh, topics. And we do a number of e-learning tools, events, videos, have documents and links available as well, um, which is why I, I sort of said those links to some of those resources that I put up before are available through our website. Um, and when we say that they request their supply chain um, to be able to do free training, the membership um, of our uh, to use any of the materials on our website is completely free and so businesses can log on and track and use as many licenses as they want um, to get individuals to log in and learn about this as they move through things um, and so whether that's you coming on board just to learn about modern slavery and then they you know accidentally learn about climate change that's great um, and what we've found is we survey our, our um, members every year to find out what they want um, and what they'd like us to do. Um, and, you know, three quarters of our whole membership base see us as the go-to online resource for all sustainability and knowledge. And all of that resource is available because we work with um, partner organisations who fund us and work with us. Um, and so all of these wonderful people on the screen at the moment are all of um, our partner organisations that enable us to operate as a not-for-profit and get this information freely available for everybody to use throughout the supply chain. And one that I sort of have to showcase on that list is our partnership with ASCII. Um, and to, to give you um, a bit of an update, so the partnership that we form with ASCII is around trying to educate everybody on not just modern slavery, but around sustainability um, through the supply chain industry. Um, and for our efforts in that space, that uh, we're now finalists um, in the Mercury Awards for the Sustainability Initiative Award, and that'll get um, awarded in April. Um, when that awards ceremony comes on board. Um, and whilst this is the first in a series of, uh, of webinars um, that we'll be running with ASCII um, on modern slavery, if at any point in time there's a stack of more resources available, um, like I said, all freely available on our website, you can go and hunt in our catalogue and filter just for modern slavery if that's what you're after, um, and then access a stack of those different links and videos if you want to show people internally um, the two minute version of what modern slavery is and why you should care. Um, or if you wanna go and do a full um, e-learning module to find out more information, um, though all of those resources are available as well, um, freely available to everybody. You can log on and sign up today. So thank you everybody. I suppose that's me speaking for a good 50 minutes <laughs> on getting everything through. Um, and if there are questions that people have sent through Clint, we can 
address them now. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Firstly, thank you, Haley, for your time this afternoon. That has been very informative. Uh, for our listeners, we do have a couple of questions that have come through, but if you do have any questions, do feel free to use the Q&A box and I will read those to Haley and get a response. Don't worry, I'll do it uh, anonymously so that you do not have to worry about asking questions that you might be a bit shy to ask. So uh, we've got two at the moment, Haley. The first is, what has been the effect of modern slavery on government as regards significant shifts or obligations, free trade agreements? Yeah, so it's interesting, the, um, the government response um, to this hasn't been as openly discussed as what we'd all like it to be. So one of the um, I says one of the requirements of the Act is that the Australian government has to put out a modern slavery statement, just like other organisations in this space. Um, and there's a lot of people eagerly awaiting exactly what they're going to be putting out <laughs> to be able to get all of this through. Um, because in terms of, of, of that government response um, to where things are at, it's always been... Um, it's always been a factor when negotiating those free trade agreements as to the conditions in other countries. Um, and there's a, a lot of correlation between, you know, when we're setting things up and we're looking to import things and we're solely only looking at the cost of those goods as they come in um, and we're ignoring all the other factors that are associated with importing um, those goods, then you're naturally going to get a variant in how that all works. And so um, uh, it's, you know, you, we see this internationally with, um, you know, America upping all of its um, tariffs on Chinese goods um, for different reasons. Um, and, and, you know, human rights is definitely one of those reasons that are involved in negotiating all of those, those outcomes. So um, I am waiting very much like everybody else on exactly how the government chooses to um, address its requirements around modern slavery. Um, then also the impact of the Act um, as they report back to Parliament on um, the effects of this uh, when it comes to other areas as well. Great. All right, next question. Has there been recent examples from investor stakeholder community through ESG or responsible investment that has highlighted the significance the stakeholder community is placing on modern slavery? Yes, yeah, so I suppose in terms of um, recent examples that I'm allowed to disclose, I don't have any that I can't breach confidentiality to be able to get to you. Um, but I was speaking, uh, we speak with our partners about this a lot and do internal workshops with them on where they're getting all of this drive from. Um, and uh, as, uh, as recent as last week, I was speaking to one um, corporate social responsibility uh, manager who was in charge of responding to investor queries. Um, and she was saying that at the moment there are two or three investor questionnaires per week that she's answering on this topic. Um, so I think that the investor community, especially because most of those investment organizations are going to fall um, above that hundred million revenue turnover. And they're all knowing that they're going to have to put out their modern slavery statements and identify where within their investment portfolio are there risks of modern slavery and what are they doing to try and eradicate those uh, we're starting to see all of that pressure then coming through to everybody looking to invest so i mean i, I deal a lot in the built environment and sort of those large um, big contractors and areas but there's certainly a push um, through all of those uh, that investment community um, to try and eradicate that um, I think as well, because it's seen to be um, a fairly high risk area off of um, portfolio investments. Um, so it's, you know, if you think of a case of um, like the rip curl example um, that I put out there, um, if at really short notice, your entire company and brand can be diminished quite significantly, um, then they're looking to try and, and de-risk their portfolios by ensuring that where the money is invested, it's in the least risk opportunities of the highest return. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. And we have one last question for the time being, which I think is uh, quite a curly one. What are some practical, effective actions to take if modern slavery is found in the supply chain? I would suspect that terminating the contract isn't assisting with the goal of trying to eliminate modern slavery. 
Great question. And this is one that I talk with people about a lot. And so whilst this webinar is meant to be an introductory one, it's certainly one of the topic areas that we're looking to include in future webinar series. Um, because the area of, well, when, what do you do when you find it and the remediation actions involved um, and how do you um, deal with those is something that a lot of organisations are dealing with at the moment. And you are spot on that the, the strong intent of the act is that you try and remove it from the chain, but not eliminate the supplier from your supply chain. So step one should always be um, use your position of influence and power over the relationship to affect a positive outcome for the people in that risk in, in, that are at risk in that chain. Now that obviously comes with a million complications um, and it's definitely a topic for a webinar by itself um, because of course, um, what most people tend to, um, to look at when they look at the risks in that situation are the corporate risks or the reputational risks. Um, and they tend to not understand that the intent of the act is to eliminate the risks to people. So if you're, you know, you must get consent from a victim in order to act on their behalf in this space. And you might not be aware of uh, your, whatever your actions may be, you might actually put that person at greater risk um, than without you doing anything. And so there is a, um, a, a sort of a flow of action um, that needs to take place in order to address these. And it's definitely a topic for another webinar. Um, but essentially you're looking through that if someone's, if there's an immediate criminal act that's taking place, like you're watching people being forcibly put into transport to and from a workplace, um, then you must notify the authorities to get that to stop. Um, there are a number of different victim support groups out there that can help people through that process of um, when, once you've rescued somebody, then what processes are available to them. Um, but often people within that situation have been given a lot of misinformation about what their rights are um, and about what opportunities are available to them. Um, and sometimes that um, the outcomes of those might not be favourable for them. So if they have if they have been um, shipped into your supply chain, um, believing that they have the appropriate visas and authority to work in a country, and then after exposing that situation, it's found that they don't have that appropriate authority to work, then it's likely they're going to be returned um, back to their country of origin. And sometimes that may not be a safe option for them, which means that they won't give you consent to act on their behalf and remaining in that condition of slavery, they might foresee that to be favourable to the outcome of going home. Um, and there's that type of scenario is one that is likely to occur as you start to work through and discover um, incidences of modern slavery within your supply chain. But absolutely the intent must be to protect the victims within that supply chain um, and that remediate them in there is uh, in whatever way they want remediation to occur. And that it's important that you don't um, overlay your own projections of what you think the, the outcome should be, um, but really what's important to them. And of course, that's going to be entirely customizable depending on that situation that that person has been in. Um, so, you know, if you're finding that there are children who are being completely deprived of their childhood and education, um, they may just want to go to school and be returned home to their families. Um, you know, uh, some people may be trying to seek the wages that haven't been paid to them um, or that were, you know, extorted from them through exorbitant fees and salary deductions. Um, so there's many different um, outcomes of, of when it's all being discovered. But to jump back to the original question of, you know, should you cut the contract? That's usually the worst thing to do. Definitely use your position of influence to try and negotiate a better outcome. Okay, and we've got one final question before we do close off the webinar. If there are any questions that you think of post, do feel free to email those through to inquiries at ascii.org.au and I'd be more than happy to pass those on to Hayley. Uh, maybe they all get addressed in a future webinar. So further encouragement to join the future webinars. Um, the question we have here uh, is, are there any initiatives underway to score companies on modern slavery, i.e. to avoid multiple questionnaires from all customers, industry-wide initiatives, for example? Yeah, absolutely there are. And I think that that's one of the... Um when you talk about that, the aspect of those slavery statements about collaborating with others within your industry, um, we're, we're definitely seeing that organisations banding together 
um, in order to do this is, is an aspect of this that's really important. Um, and the best example that I have to share with you is there's a um, sustainability group within the Property Council of Australia um, that we've joined their working group and they have launched a questionnaire um, for the property industry and the supply chain within the property industry um, where they combined, they got together and generated a common questionnaire so that one questionnaire only had to go out because they obviously you can imagine that there are significant overlap in all of their supply chains with similar types of work. Um, and they invested in a platform where um, suppliers have to log in once, they answer one questionnaire and then all of their suppliers that are partners within that conglomerate can um, access the answers to those questions um, and be able to use them with their own, their own individual risk assessments. Um, so if you, you know, um, the, there's links to, like I said, links to the Property Council questionnaire on, on the school's website. Um, but if you're jumping on Google and with the Property Council of Australia Modern Slavery questionnaire, you can see those, um, that's coming up live as well. So that's currently in a pilot phase. It's been sent to sort of the first wave of people within that supply chain, but those questions will be made publicly available once the, um, in a couple of weeks time, once the site goes fully public. Um, and, you know, we hope that most people are sort of accessing the same type of questions within the industry. Um, and, and we're working with our other industry partners around trying to ensure that similar questions are being asked across the board. Um, just mostly so that, you know, I'm sure that you're all aware of, you know, you get asked, you know, 20 different questionnaires from 20 different um, customers on what you're doing. Um, and then if you're ac actively trying to send out a questionnaire to all of your supply chain and they're you know, at the same point, also getting requests from all of their other um, customers, then it does make um, compliance with this. You know, we, we want people to be spending time eradicating this from the supply chains, not filling out questionnaires. Um, so that absolutely is great question. Absolutely great advice. Hayley, thank you very much for your time. For all of you who have joined the webinar this afternoon, thank you for attending. I do very much encourage you to head over to supplychainschool.org.au, check out the website and uh, sign up for some of that training. And as always, keep an eye on the what's on section on the ASCII website, ascii.org.au, to uh, get involved in future uh, webinars. Thank you all for attending. Goodbye for now.